take the time. Seconds to spare. <laughs> <laughs> Go out and come back in. <laughs> you got your timing down pretty good this time, Bruce. <laughs> it's like, what? All right, it is six o'clock. Welcome everyone to the April 2nd meeting of the SoCal Creek Water District. Um, roll call shows all of our board of directors are here. There is no public hearing tonight. Uh, there is, next on, on the agenda is the consent agenda. So is there anyone of the directors that wishes anything to be taken off of consent? Me. Anyone in the public? Hearing none. I move all the consent agenda. Sorry, I had well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I wonder if you could pull item 3.6 from the consent agenda. Sure. Thank you. All right, so. I will move all the other five. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? All right, so item 3.6. Since we were ready to proceed, go ahead, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you very much. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I wanted you to discuss a little more item 3.6, which involves approving an additional $50,000 for um, Guterres Consulting um, to help you get uh, additional grant funding and manage grant funding for the Pure Water SoCal project. I, um, I am aware that she um, already has a substantial contract with you. I think I read in the material that this um, $50,000 was not, amount was not um, really in the budget for this, but it's being taken out of the reserves. And I want to register protest um, regarding this because the project is under litigation. And normally, when agencies have legal agents, uh, action filed against them, they stop um, because it is risky to proceed. And so I just want to protest that your board would consider spending an additional $50,000 uh, to move the project forward at a time when it is under litigation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I move approval of 3.6. Moved and seconded. Both motions. Oh, the public comment period's over there. What's that? The public comment period was already, we already no, had I, that. I was waiting to make a public comment. You, it was clear. So I have no, a well go ahead then. On 3.6 as well. Go ahead, you have something Another constructive right, to say? Colonel Terry Maxwell and I'm a rate payer, and I'm a pretty smart guy about observing organizations failing to comply with things like the California Environmental Quality Act, the Brown Act, and also simply comply with fiduciary standards of management of the money, millions of dollars of rate payers' money who trust you with it. Um, the the 3.6 item, why would you approve a contract? Why did you approve a $110,000 contract that was inflated and from my own professional experience, preposterous that Mr. Basso proposed to hire a law firm to look at contracting um, arrangements that are out two to three years, perhaps never, before you have a, a environmental quality approval, which you didn't do properly, before you're free of the litigation restraints of a restraining order. Why would you waste the money of your ratepayers time after time after time? Some of you have been in business 
You know what it is to be responsible for stockholders' money. The ratepayers are your stockholders. And you are negligent as blazes watching their money, preserving their money, committing their money, and wasting it in many cases. This is a waste, absolutely, as Ms. Steinbrenner points out. The $110,000 to the law firm was a waste. Those fees should have been more than 6000 if any. Um, again, it is just tragic how you've wasted the stock, the, your, your, your customers' money. And in, in, again, another example of it. Do not approve this. Thank Do you. not approve anything until you have, if you ever will, and you won't if there's any justice, succeeded with an environmental impact review that is satisfactory according to California and also f indirectly, albeit federal law, which you have not done. Your environmental impact review is a total fraud to anybody intellectually informed about its requ the requirements and anybody informed about the water realities, which are there are alternatives to poop water so kill. Do not approve that a moment longer. All right. So um, Again, I've got we, a, I've I'm got just going to, I just want to mention one thing. Just, yeah. you know, we can agree to disagree, but I, I don't, I get a little bit tired of you coming up here and yelling every time. So if you could just tone it down, I'd appreciate well, I'd that. Happy to do that. Thank you. And I, I have another request that you keep your comments to the pertinent item. Yes. I move okay. those, the, these two items it's again. It's already been. Uh, well, so we, we knew we were going to have to. Okay. I'll yeah. second it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. All right, next on the agenda is oral communications for items not on tonight's agenda. So if anyone from the public wishes to address us on something that is not on tonight's agenda, now is the time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, we have many times agreed that there is a real disconnect between water policy, water use, and land use. And in my um, research regarding um, legal matters, <laughs> I came upon something that I had not been aware of before, and it's um, SB, um, <laughs> SB 601, I think, and SB 221. They were laws passed in 2001 that requires um, water agencies to submit to the planning jurisdictions um, water availability s reports when there are developments um, on the table. And I've never seen that before. So I wanted to also bring to your attention that that is a requirement when a city and or a county is going to amend a general plan. And that is exactly what the county of Santa Cruz is in the process of doing now, up updating their 1994 general plan. And I want to just let you know that there are big changes planned for this county. And I hope that you will take an active part in submitting these reports and uh, analyses, which must be detailed and thorough, and um, that they are submitted in a timely manner so that there is not a disconnect between land use and water policy and availability. I'd like to use the balance of my time um, to read into the record, maybe not. <laughs> The um, lawsuit that I have filed, there are um, a number of public ac uh, causes of action, and um, I think I left them at my chair, so I will just list them. Um, they are that the board certified an EIR that did not properly address and respond to agency comment, specifically uh, trustee agencies, namely Fish and Wildlife, Department of Water Resources, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. There are 18 stream crossings proposed for this project, and those agencies should have commented on this project and been involved consulting to come up with the mitigations that are enforceable. In the draft EIR, it says that your agency will be the one that enforces the mitigations, but that's not possible when Fish and Wildlife has not had a hand in making sure that those are 
enforceable. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else on an item not on tonight's agenda? Okay. All right. Any any board members? Oral communication. No. Good. All I right. Um, yes, ma'am. I actually typed up notes from all the the sessions that I went to in Aqua. I mean, sorry. Um, what were you? Water reuse. Yeah, I did too, actually. And I was looking at them, and I just wanted to share some things that I typed out. Mm -hmm. One is that the Montebello Four Bay has been replenishing their groundwater with tertiary water since 1962. And that was interesting to me because I thought it was mm -hmm. something a lot <coughs> newer than that. And um, also that LA <coughs> Department of Water and Power's goal is to use 100% recycled water or reuse water as part of their 2020 urban management plan. That's what their goal is. Um, I actually I attended from grand to gradual implementing groundwater replenishment in LA. It was very interesting. Um, maximizing groundwater use in the central and west coast basins through recycled water from Hyperion. And then I also looked at some stormwater presentations and you know that I'm totally into stormwater and using it somehow. Um, and they're talking about urban runoff being looked at as the next frontier for water, for drinking water. And if this water can be stored and released into the sewer system, they could use it for um, purified water or you could, per you could treat it if you had it in a basin somewhere that you could treat it there and then add it to um, drinking water. <laughs> and one of the, of course, one of the ideas that I was thinking is that um, Aptos Beach at the Esplanade, all the water goes down into that parking lot. And if somebody would put in a big retention basin there, it could be stored and we wouldn't have the flooding in that area. And then later it could be pumped into either the, um, if we run out of poop water, we can use that water. <laughs> to um, to do our um, purification. So um, there's lots of people looking because there's not enough water out there and sewer water is an important source because it's mostly water. Right, okay. <laughs> Alrighty, then um, the next item on the agenda is uh, up, uh, updates from the MGA or GSP advisory committee meetings. Yeah, I just put this on the agenda uh, in case uh, any of the board members that attended the uh, either the M last MGA or GSP meeting. I will give a brief introduction, but in case they wanted to, to talk about it. At the MGA, um, I may confuse the two meetings, but the main item there was the budget. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be much less than last year. I'm looking to see if I got those notes in front of me. I don't, but I think it's around... We're still doing the 70-10-10 split, and I think it's around uh, half a million will be s the district's share going next year. And of course, you know, we got the $1.5 million grant for the GSP, so that helps all the agencies. And then at the GSP committee, or was it the MGA? <laughs> I can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, been so many meetings lately. Um, Cameron Tana of, Hyd of uh, Montgomery and Associates presented some modeling results that were interesting. And and just what it was was, you know, we've gone through a couple di different iterations they have of modeling Pure Water Soquel and ASR, then Pure Water Soquel through the MGAIs and, you know, enhanced and uh, ASR enhanced and uh, brought those together a little bit and showing uh, the impacts of uh, the, the Improved ASR, aquifer storage and recovery that the city's looking at, um, and uh, pure water SoCal. And I, I think the take home lesson for me was ASR helps in the, this area of the, the basin, but uh, still there's, there's issues even with both projects. And I think when we go on to the next item, that'll, that'll show forth even more. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the GSP meeting. I thought it was very exciting. I mean, for the first time, you saw one graph with um, pure water by itself and ASR by itself and both together, as well as if you don't do anything, that baseline, as they call it. So four different possibilities on one graph. And baseline and, uh, and the 
aquifer storage and retrieval ASR both failed multiple times. You know, many times they'd go below the uh, below line protection. for protective levels. And p pure water, and then if you add in ASR with pure water, it made it even a tiny bit better. But that worked for most of the areas in the, in the district and elsewhere. It didn't work for um, the very far east part of our basin, you know, the um, La Selva and that kind of area. And it also didn't work in the very far west. And of course, the very far west was kind of reasonable because when we originally designed it, it was just to protect the district and wasn't meant to protect the, the city's basin area. Yeah. And, uh, and But I'm, I'm very excited about it because it, that was the first time we put it together and we haven't adjusted things. And so where we place the various wells and how much we pump into or out of the wells and uh, that, that hasn't been modified yet, Jim. And just like we've done with our, our pumping uh, basis uh, changes, uh, we have, you know, took a rough cut at that too. So I think it's exciting that you know, we're, we're delta close, I think, to having a, a, a complete solution that works. And so I was very excited about that. When, when will we see that graph? I, I haven't, have, have you seen that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, got I can pull it up if you, I mean, I have it on yeah. a, a chip here if we want to do Yeah, why that. don't you pull that up? Okay. Are we, if you want to proceed. I'll, I'll talk while yeah. mm -hmm. you're doing that. Okay, go for it. So likewise, it, it was a quantum leap forward mm -hmm. in that instead of mm -hmm. separate projects, how do they interplay with each other? Mm -hmm. And there were hints at optimization you know where you can increase by by having uh, the recharge from the recycled water you could decrease pumping mm -hmm. in other areas like the aromas and the selva uh, go to me, no, no. and um, yeah no it's it was pretty exciting H -O -O -O. another thing that that why Ron's pulling that up is that we're getting a little closer in to coming up with a climate change That's one. scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the five-year averages are really good. Mm -hmm. um, and But one thing that, that uh, struck me, and I hadn't thought about this as, mu as much since I'm focused on seawater intrusion, is that the effect of climate change on the uh, San Lorenzo River flow they had a CMIP 2.1, which is admittedly a, a dry scenario, where the the amount of uh, the average amount of river water in the next 50 years would be only 59 percent of what it's been in the past 30 years. So it's pretty drastic, and that that would limit what you can do with river water. Yeah. Also makes me worry a little bit about the salmon or or the tra steelhead or. Yeah. Anything else trying to? So, uh, Dr. Daniels, you want me to take a crack at this, or sure, you want to? Okay. So, I'll just go through a couple of these, and people can chime in. But what you see here are two wells circled where uh, recharge would be happening. This dotted line is the level we need to get to to be sustainable. This is groundwater elevations, and then this shows um, the different model projections, so ASR and uh, uh, pure water. On this end of the basin, pure water helps a little bit, but not as much as uh, uh, the ASR. Now here they go over, um, there, there's some of the other aquifers. So you can see the yellow is if you do nothing. So we're below this dashed line, which is sustainability. And then here, ASR is in this color. These are five-year averages, so it's a little deceiving. I thought, um, our directors did a really good job of bringing that out, and I think we'll discuss it on the next slide. And here's pure water uh, up here, and then this is the combo of pure water and ASR. But even if you go back to even that one, you can see the dotted green line, which is just ASR, goes below protective levels in a number of years. There it goes, you know, going up and down and up and down. Some years it's below protective levels, even a five-year average. Right, right. And does the next one... And that's, and that's a five-year average, that's so a five any year. one or two years. Yes, I think it's earlier, Ron, in Is the Is it earlier? Okay, yep, yeah, earlier. so. Um, it shows it without Yeah, uh, so let me that. see, something's weird. Yeah, so here it, it is. is. So here are the kind of um, year by year, and the 
this blue is the combo, but the if you focus on the, what is this, light blue, you can see when it dips down below this line, anytime it does that, basically seawater intrusion takes a step forward. Yeah. Yep. And so this, this I don't think would be uh, So that's when, the, that's when they're pumping out, mm -hmm. and when it's the peaks are where, when they're yeah, it injecting. recharging, yeah. which is great. Uh, get it up there. Um, you know, there'll be some push out and pull in, but it's, uh, yeah, I described it as two steps forward, one step back, but. Uh, and, they, and they make the comment that the ASR wells are located much higher up in the basin. Uh, if you can go up, yeah. there's those three, uh, those three uh, tri triangle-like things is where yeah. the, they put the ASR wells. Yeah. And clearly they need to move at least one of them down f closer to those yeah. wells there. Yeah. So they realize that this is a, is a work in progress and, you know, modification needs to be done. I mean, they don't even have the water rights to do this yet, but, um, you know, this is, this is the way right. it, it moves. Uh, and then there's just a couple others uh, went through. Here's where, and I think we looked at that one, it's below the entire time. Here, over time, we, we get it up mm -hmm. in these wells here. And then here's another uh, scenario you can see above and then below in this well. So there's a lot of configuration to try to make some of this water come over to help in that layer and that sort of thing. And this is just on the um, far east, western side of the basin um, where uh, their ASR really doesn't have much influence. I mean, uh, has an influence and, and, and pure water has less influence. So it, it doesn't, ASR doesn't help on the other side of the basin, so to speak. So anyway. Um, here we go, Qu up high, quite there, so But even this one, you see that e e even, even yep. the, inc the daily, th the, not the yearly thing for the uh, one up in the upper right-hand corner stays above the dotted line the, the entire time. Yeah. When Whereas it's combined. When it's combined, yes. Yeah. Well, but either, either pure water, which is the green, stays just flat up, and when you add the co combo, it's, it's much more up and down, but even so, the yeah. down never goes below the protective level. Right. Whereas the light blue. Well, it just it stays it down most does. of the time. So it would be violating it all the time. So the district doing more in lieu, um, pumping less in other areas, creating kind of an iron curtain, and pumping more in a recharge area would be something we would adjust <coughs> there. And, and it goes on. Data. And so um, it basically shows that ASR m in most of the entire basin only works when it's combined with pure water. That's the only, the only yeah. thing that works. Right. And then here, it's really protected. So you basically, pure water enables the city to come in and do their ASR. Otherwise, they couldn't. Yeah, because yeah, this is com almost completely dominated <coughs> by uh, uh, by pure water. Pure water. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise it's down there and it's violating. Yeah, they and don't. And they just I don't do any. Yeah. On the next item, I was going to mention that I I, I told the, uh, the city water commission and the uh, um, the Wasac people who were also there. I mentioned about. Uh, uh, sigma, and that one of the things that is required is that you have a plan that's sustainable, that they determine can be done, and that you actually do it. And that if you fail to do that, they've already said that the state is required to come in and take over your basin. And what they have implied, it's not in the law, but they've implied that this is going to be so complicated, their solution for every basin will be um, just cutbacks. cutbacks. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I remember too. So. And then here, here's more, more of it. Um, some people misunderstood these graphs, I think, but um, for the most part, a lot of people got them. It is, it is complicated. It's, it's high-level <coughs> groundwater modeling. And that last one is something that we'll have to work on. Because of the west. Because it's, it's very far east. Yeah. yeah. So we need to either cut back pumping more there or move some of our recharge wells further that way, but that needs to be looked yeah, at, too. Yeah, time. Yeah. So uh, that's, I'll just. That's great. Yeah, and there you can see it Thank again Thank you very and again. much for sharing that. Yeah. 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 We'll pull that one out. It's, ex it's exciting. Um, and do we, shall we transition right into the Water Commission meeting then? We can here. I'll let you. Do we want? Oh, did you have something you wanted to say on the, on the, reg related to the MGA meeting? Yeah. Thank you. I was there too. Thank you. And what I'm noticing here that I didn't notice at the MGA meeting is that different wells within the same unit have different protective levels. And I hadn't noticed that at the presentation, but I'm seeing that here tonight. That's because the, the 
formations slant. So if you do it here, it's much further down than if you do it there. I see. Okay. They all have different. All right. Thank you. Um, what I thank you for explaining that. Um, what I took away and and was quite surprised to hear Cameron Tanner from Montgomery and Associates say is that it looked like to him in the modeling that the uh, city's ASR wells were were too close to the proposed pure water SoCal injection wells and that it would actually overcharge the groundwater and it would bring the groundwater level up to surface can, uh, levels and that didn't make a lot of sense to me but again that's what Rosemary Menard said again last night so I've never heard that said before. I've always heard that if you, you can recharge to a point and then you get leakage out into the streams and the bay. So that was an interesting bit of news that, that I learned. And um, also that um, the models presented did not include in lieu only, which I thought was interesting because at the enrichment workshop for modeling, um, Cameron Tana had said that he really felt that INLU presents the most flexibility for addressing um, seawater intrusion at various sites over time and changing conditions. So I th thought it was interesting that that was not even modeled. Um, and he has also said that um, Cameron Tan has also said that current groundwater water levels are not unsustainable. So that's kind of a double negative, but what he was saying was that in some areas, what we have now is sustainable. Well, there are problem areas that in some areas of the aquifer, things are okay. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. It was a very good meeting. I enjoyed it too. I'd like to respond to that. Sure. So, just a second, I'm responding. Please. You'll get your chance. I'm waiting. Um, so, I think there might be confusion about the term in lieu. You might be thinking that's in lieu with river water transfers, but it's in lieu with, with any scheme whatsoever. <coughs> so, if the district decides not to pump from a well, that's in lieu. And takes water from a different well, so yeah, I agree with Cameron that you can you can adjust water levels by not pumping from an area, and then um, the other thing, and, and I did hear what Cameron said about its potential to um, if the wells are too close to each other to have the the water level actually go above the surface, and to me that that's very encouraging. That means that you can use, you can redistribute pumping, or you can choose not to to recharge in those areas as much. So, yeah, of course, it's not something that operationally you would do. It's just, it, to me, it shows the potential for redistributing pumping. For instance, uh, pumping closer to the to the recharge of the of the purified water and um, reducing pumping in the aromas where there's seawater intrusion occurring actively now. The other possibility is since we only have one on recharge well in the ground now and the others are still to be done, is move them around to the right places. <coughs> now that you see yeah. that they're conflicting, okay, put one elsewhere and right. spread them out. And there was talk about the city putting their um, aquifer storage and recovery wells closer to the belts wells, right. which, for example, one of them is just across the river from the main street well. So in summer, both of them will be pumping out, and therefore that would perhaps dewater the creek. You don't want that. You don't want that. So that's a mistake. Yeah. yeah. To me, the whole presentation was, uh, you know, these are are possibilities, and here's the facts and. It's the first step in in in, in uh, deciding how to proceed to to get the most benefit out of out of the, the two two projects. But right out of the door, doing this well is a good sign. 
Yeah. And we haven't done any of the redistribution. We haven't moved wells around to better places. And all those are possible. Yeah, it's, and the model can keep helping us optimize it, I'm sure, exactly. yeah, as, yeah. as we go forward. And the data, once it comes right. in, yeah. to check the model. And also, like, it's worth pointing out to people, uh, to customers, that this is what the water district has water districts do, they are constantly monitoring all their wells, what pumping levels, and making adjustments. This model is enabling the general basin, all the all the water operators in the basin to fine tune what they, and really narrow down where it will be optimal to change pumping levels, inject the ideal spot for an ASR project, you know, if put an ASR project into the wrong place, it will just flow out to the ocean. It won't store water for you that you'll have in a, during a drought period. So there's a lot of information that came, and I thought it was really worthwhile myself, and uh, that it's a lot more tools for water managers now. Good. Yes, sir. Colonel Terry Maxwell again. I also attended that meeting heard Mr. Tanner's presentation and all the others, and I spoke with him and others at breaks and afterwards. And frankly, Ms. Steinbrenner's comments are quite accurate. But in addition to that, once again, you have failed to consider the for alternatives. I talked to people who were on the city advisory group, and they said we were never informed about the for alternative. Very interesting, Mr. Basso showing your clients fail to consider alternatives in their EIR, which is technically a fraud on the public. S in addition to that, Mr. McGillvoy, Scott McGillvoy, Did that have anything yes. to do with the meeting last Didn't night? I, well, y yes, that came up. The alternatives came up. Well, okay. The, the Mid-County, I attended the whole meeting. I've got notes. I'll be happy to show them to you. So it came, and, and I brought up the question, had they considered and been informed about the locker for alternative, Mr. McGillvoy's surface water recovery? On the north, no. The other thing I learned there from people who've attended that and been on, or pointed to it, they said they were being spoon-fed favorable information to approve pure water, poop water, SoCal, and not anything about the alternatives. That astonished me. They, and they said they've been spoon-fed to the point of ignorance. That has disappointed me. Uh, once again, I urge you to consider the aquifer alternative in a meaningful, intellectually honest, scientifically honest way, which you've never done. Consider Mr. McElvoy's proposals in, in parallel with that, which you've never done. And don't even consider adding $100 million plus on the backs of all of your customers and ratepayers. You're going off topic again, okay? No, well, that's, it right. relates to what the topic yeah, was there. vaguely. Okay? Okay. All right, so. Um, we need to rectify get the record straight again on who has the decision making I mean yeah I'd power for it seems for like we've said it like a hundred times but section, section seven of the ER lays out the requirements for what an alternative is and it's something that the agency has some control over we have no control over the aquifer or the river right any project having over, to do with those over would have, would have to be come to us from the city we have right. no control over. We have influence, perhaps, but not control. But it's not nothing we can consider in until yeah. right. yeah. so it's so presented to so us. So two things I'll just note after that before we move on to the next item. Uh, I, I believe this detailed modeling of the ASR to the GSP advisory committee is, is pertinent information. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the comment that they're not being uh, shown information on that, so I, I'm not sure I understand that. And I will say... Uh, in speaking with Cameron Tana, he did say that he feels that people misunderstood, uh, and it's it's not unexpected. It's complicated stuff. The the term in lieu that it was only applied to the river, and that's certainly not the case. Right. So anyway, um, what item are we on now? So we kind of oozed into the water commission meeting, mm -hmm. right? Kinda. So I mean, they they overlap they because do. that's I mean, I yeah. have I yeah. have something from yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, Gary Fisk presented a slide that I took a picture of. I think we have it here. Do you have it, the one with the, um, with the percentage time? Yeah. So that, so what this, there is historical and then three different climate change uh, scenarios. And 
it's looking at what the, the number, the percentage of years where um, you would be able to achieve both um, a w river water transfer, and it has 1,500 acre feet, 500 acre feet, and 300 acre feet, and the target that the city has, which was originally 3.2 billion gallons. And in 2016 to 2018, they reduced it. But if you, if you look at without infrastructure, which is the whole, the three columns uh, the to the left, um, you're talking about anywhere from zero to 45% of the time, 45 percent of the years you would be able to both meet the city needs and um, transfer 1500 acre feet to Soquel so couldn't happen even half the time it gets better if you improve the Graham Hill water treatment plant but it only gets up to 55 percent of the time with the 1500 but it there are um, there's both of them have c uh, columns of 300 acre feet, which is what <coughs> the pilot program is. And that is able to, depending on the climate change scenario, able to, to <coughs> meet more. Still it's only 3% of the time for the severe climates with the 3.2 billion gallons, but up to 100% of the time for less city demand that 2016 to 2018 <coughs> and with uh, less severe climate change. A lot of uncertainty. Right. So, no, I mean, not only is our typical program that we've been trying to do now n not possible in every year, gets <coughs> much more dire if we needed more water. Right. Okay. Well, the, the other thing that they mentioned with these, these came from the, what the name of the model Confluent. is? Confluence. Confluence model. The confluence model is just bloody wrong. He assumes, for one thing, that if they put a thousand gallons into the basin, they immediately lose 20% of it, so it's 800 gallons, and then that stays in the basin forever. So it could be a, a century, and it would still be sitting there waiting for them. Clearly, that's wrong. Uh, also, isn't that wrong? Isn't that crazy? And uh, then they also assume that uh, that's the maximum that ever gets lost. That it, you know, it, they can put as much in as they want and actually fill up the basin and that'll s still be sitting there waiting for them and there'll be no lossage and that's wrong in fact what happens is that as you fill up the basin more and more of it flows to the streams and in our case the oceans um, the scotts valley did a model like this for their re pure water and it showed that it came up and flattened off in fact our model shows the same thing it comes up and flattens off and the flatten off is because you know you're adding water to the basin but water is flowing out of the basin at the same rate. Yeah, it reaches so a steady state. It, yes, exactly. So, so those numbers are actually over overestimating. Oh, yes, yes. So instead of Optimistic. zero to 45% yes. without modifications to the Graham Hill <coughs> water treatment plant, it's significantly less. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, can I, so I mean, what they did is they modeled um, confluence model first dispatches water that's uh, the, the minimum necessary required by the uh, state and federal government for the streams, so for the habitat. And then next is what they use in Santa Cruz, and then third to ASR, Aquifer and Storage and Recovery. And we're last on the in line if there's any water left over. So that's what that uh, chart here is, is representing. This cattle catalog climate uh, model is the one that the MGA is using. So if they were to use, the MGA is to use their numbers, it would be impossible to meet, will give us any water at their uh, projected demand, their uh, long-term projected demand. This is their near-term forecast right here. There is some availability. I think, you know, if you, if you read these two things by, uh, out of the report, the table indicates that in none of the options considered, can the city reliably provide the full amount of so of what SoCal ad has identified as its need is needed to meet in its goal of protecting the aquifer from the threat of seawater intrusion? The analysis does show that lower volumes of water are more readily available. 
for a transfer to Soquel Creek. And then I'll come back to that in a minute, but I think this statement's important because there's been a lot of discussion around this. The analysis has been the basis for statements made by the city's water director that with available water right constraints, there isn't enough water to meet both the city's needs for drought supply and Soquel Creek's need for a highly reliable supply water supply to use in addressing the ongoing uh, seawater intrusion, paraphrase just slightly. In fact, one of the things that happened is uh, Rosemary announced that they have solved the, the fish problem with NOAA, that they now have basically a tacit agreement for the HCP, the Habitat Conservation Plan, which is a requirement to go ask for water rights changes. So it looks like they have that. It's not Close signed and sealed at this moment, but basically it means more water has to go to the fish, less water is available to the city. Yeah. So as bad as these things are, when they apply these new con constraints, they'll be even worse. Yeah, and Melanie, maybe you can come up for a second because I'm gonna ask something. So I think what this indicates with, uh, if it was legal to, to transfer this water, which isn't currently, but hopefully in the near future, we all have our, uh, believe it will be uh, with the actions of the city that, um, uh, that there potentially is, is some amount of water that that'll be transferable during some periods of, uh, you know, like let's take the climate change model that we're using for the mid county. Twenty percent of the time, or eighty-five percent of the time, would be for uh, three hundred acre feet, and it goes up. You know, there's their numbers there. And do you want to mention anything about we modeled some of that, or you want to just not talk about that right now? No, we could talk about it. Okay. Um, I, I think in um, some of the modeling that we have done for Pure Water Soquel, we have evaluated uh, runs where we did assume that the pilot transfer volume would continue past the pilot phase. So even ongoing past 2020, we could get a small amount of water um, from the city in years that weren't critically dry. Yeah, so that's what we've been modeling, hoping for this best case and the city indicated us they were you know they, they asked us do you want us to see this and that was about a year and a half ago or a year ago and we said absolutely this is you know if there's water let's take it i think what the the take-home message for this chart is that in order for the city to well to protect the streams for the city to meet its demand uh during droughts and to reach groundwater sustainability <coughs> you we need two fairly large projects uh, you know, ASR and Pure Water Soquel. I mean, that's that's the the message. Well, and I I would also say I think from the meeting that we went to last night, it's it's maybe two projects and an expanded project. So that the city was pretty clear in their explanation that right now they're looking at um, kind of a, a project to do a sh uh, look back at a short term shortfall, the 2016 to 2018. But then their actual long term solution, they're going to have to go back, look at um, water demands through the urban water management plan, and then see what that second gap. So it does appear there, you know, some water agencies go out based either on funding uh, abilities or maybe they just want to roll out a project in a phased approach. That I think that was a take home message that I got last night was that the city is approaching their water supply shortfall in a phased approach. So phase one and phase two. Yeah. Um, so, so I think. Yeah, I think that's due, due, to, due to the lower near-term demand and the cost being uh, prohibitive to do, I mean, just one project was over a hundred was a hundred million dollars. I think they upgrade to Graham Hill. She she quoted. That's an important point because it plays into one of the committee members asked. Well, what about if this water that's available is cheaper than pure water SoCal? And she said, in her estimation, that. Uh, the water would not be cheaper and less expensive would probably be at that around that cost or more so that'll be something else but I do think there's opportunity sometimes even if water is a little bit uh, more expensive you know there's a there's a, uh, a gain re um, reliability and diversification so the board will have to weigh that when the time comes uh, but it just seems to indicate uh, that both agencies are on the right track to help in the community as a whole. We still have Pajaro to, to get up on its uh, feet, but um, you know they're working on that too. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Do you have any, anything on 
Any, anyone else? Yes, Bob. As soon as you're through with this, there's one thing I wanted to interject. Okay. Okay. Are, are you, no, uh, there's another speaker. Thank you. Good evening, Becky Steinbruner, Small Water Company customer. I was at last meetings, uh, last night's meeting too, and I thought it was very interesting. In in this little booklet that they had, um, the Santa Cruz City. Um, 2018 annual report, it says on page three that the, even with projected growth, water use is expected to remain flat due to price conservation and new plumbing and building codes. So I've heard Rosemary Menard say that too, and it's interesting that it's actually in print here that the city of Santa Cruz does not see their water demand going up at all or very little. So that interesting piece of information combined with the um, amended water rights place of use for the San Lorenzo River, which does include Soquel Creek Water District and Central Water District, that um, it, it could be possible that we could just use a more regional approach. And I propose to you that um, the district consider <coughs> helping Santa Cruz City <coughs> fund the improvements to infrastructure, making a bigger inner tie, improving the Graham Hill water treatment plant so that you can have these larger water volumes um, available. It's like Rick Longinati pointed out, some of these climate change models, things actually did better. There was another graph that wasn't included in here, but um, it, it was, to me, quite encouraging that maybe not 100% of the time, but a good amount of, of the time, there, there could be plenty of water to send in a regional approach to the district. I thought it was interesting that the um, uh, demand from the WASAC, uh, the confluence um, information, did go down a lot to 2.6 acre feet a year for the 2016-2018. And um, the, the common thread in all of these different climate change models is that this area is projected to actually become wetter. Um, the, the model that the GFDL, that the WASAT group used, is the hotter, drier of the models that have been considered here, but, but even with that, there is at least 50% of the time, 55% of the time, with an improved Graham Hill water treatment plant that the district needs could be met with surface water and existing infrastructure. If you were to help them fund. Now, I realize that's not in your district, but neither Thank is you. the Chanticleer site. Thank you. For Pure Water SoCal. Colonel Terry Maxwell, on the same points Ms. Steinberg mentioned and the same points mentioned from the panel, and the same points in the uh, paperwork and the reports referred to, and the same mentions to the comments last night. The big picture is consolidation of City of Santa Cruz water and Soquel Water Creek District, and the region cannot happen fast enough. It cannot happen fast enough environmentally. It cannot happen fast enough to save your ratepayers from the burdensome $100 million you're proposing for poop to scoop or pure water Soquel, which is completely unnecessary if one takes an intellectually honest an evidentiary-based approach looking at the Lockerford proposal, Mr. McIlvoy's proposal, and the regional resources, the regional water resources, and also learns the lessons from 40 years of negligence, <coughs> especially in the last 20, demonstrated by the Board of Directors and the senior staff of the Soquel Creek Water District. And I'll be happy to support that with boxes of materials. Once again, the solution is a regional consolidation, the, the solution is to look at all the water resources of perhaps the and central coast. How is this coast. related to last night's meeting? The, the, those resources came up. Mr. Longinati mentioned those resources. Uh, the fact that the city's got adequate resources, perhaps, the climate change issues, and the fact that we may, in fact, have more water than heretofore has been the history. But even without that heretofore climate change additional water, there is no legitimate need 
if an honest analysis is applied to consider the Lockerford proposal, consider Mr. McGilvoy's proposal, and third, to look at the consolidations of the water resources here. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but you are all redundant. You are redundant because of the negligence demonstrated by the Board of SoCal Water Creek District, especially in the last 25 years, and you are redundant because of the water resources are adequate to provide for other. There's no need to impose a $100 million, $100 million uh, obligation on your customers and ratepayers with Pure Water SoCal. It's a preposterous fraud if one looks at the big picture in an intellectually honest and disciplined way, which you're not doing. You should put in place a management arrangement to petition the state to take over the water resources of the region or the U.S. Department of the Interior. That is the solution. You are redundant to addressing the water resources here, and you have been irresponsible towards your customers and ratepayers' money. In all of the contracts you put out to look at, at uh, DSAL and all the other contracts. You're done. Can I, I need can to I respond. Yeah. I'm afraid these two last speakers have diligently decided to ignore at that meeting, Rosemary got up and said exactly, there is not enough water in our basin, in our, in our supply, to both solve our problem and to solve SoCal's problem. She said that explicitly. She's, and the, she's and the water written that as well, and the very clearly. And the Water Commission accepted it. Most of the Wasac people accepted it, and they said, go ahead and do all this. So I'm afraid we've got some folks who just want to ignore science, want to ignore facts, and want to live on, on never, never land. But, um, and keep saying the same thing over exactly. and over. But it's just not going to happen. And All right. You, I, I'm I ready to move on. Well, Ron, I, I, we both Bob? have something. I, I wanted to mention, because there was a prior comment about um, Senate Bill, it was referred to as 601, it's 610, and also Senate Bill 221, mm -hmm. which do require um, that agencies deal with the uh, with the, with the projects, but a project as defined in those sections is a residential development of more than 500 dwelling units, mm -hmm. a proposed shopping center of more than 500,000 square feet, a commercial office building of more than 250,000 square feet, a proposed hotel of more than 500 rooms, et cetera. So none of those have ever come up in th before this board in the time since those have been enacted. I don't think so it's even totally happened in the county. Yeah, they're, they're, that's addressed in the, um, we, we do that. Okay. I do want to say, because it's something, um, thank you, Bob, are you done? You could, uh, that, okay, thank you for explaining that. That uh, there's this misconception, I've heard it out there, and it's, it's easy to understand why people might think it, that if the consolidation were to happen, all the uh, water issues would be solved. And matter of fact, a man from the Sierra Club got up last night and, and said, Based on that table and that information, it's my understanding that being one whole district, a consolidation would not solve the issue in the way people think, like water. And, and Rosemary Menard ans responded to the Sierra Club member, yes, that is correct. That does not have any bearing on the solution. So I just want to make sure that's understood. Right. And we are all working together as yeah, part of yeah, the M absolutely. MGA anyway. Yeah. So, all right. Shall we move on to um, item 6.1? Taj is ready. Good evening. Only one will serve letter for you to consider. Uh, it's a minor land division, and in that newly created lot, they're proposing to build a duplex off Soquel Drive. Okay. Questions, anyone? No? Okay. Uh, any, anyone from the public have a question? comment okay and um, any motions I move. move approval all oh. second all in favor aye aye, aye. opposed no okay motion carries um, next would be um, update on the 6.2 update on the water year rainfall totals so Alyssa's going to handle this one for us Good evening. Uh, tonight we've brought the board a first look at the rainfall totals for the 2018-2019 weather year. 
so that it can help inform a decision on a water shortage stage declaration at the public hearing that we have scheduled for April 16th. There, uh, just a little refresher, there are six water shortage stages outlined in our water shortage contingency plan, which is included in attachment one. Um, stage zero is considered our default conservation stage, and stages one through five indicate increasingly serious water shortage situations, and each has an associated curtailment target and emergency rates. Uh, and the district has been in a stage three emergency water shortage with a curtailment target of 25% um, for several years. And the trigger conditions for each stage include rainfall totals over the previous five years, a declared groundwater emergency or um, other hydrogeological condition, um, or a reduction in, produ in production capacity. And so we declare a water shortage stage in April because it coincides with the end of the weather year, a period of time between October 1st and March 31st when a majority of our rainfall occurs. And so for this weather year, we received a total of approximately 33.65 inches of rainfall, and that was um, as of March 25th, uh, which is above average for the same time period. When we compared this against the water shortage stage triggers um, for rainfall that were provided to us from our hydrogeology consultant, uh, we can see that we're very close to falling into a default stage zero. And so this is summarized in attachment two. And so um, as I said earlier, we will bring this back to the board on um, April 16th with additional information regarding the other trigger conditions and um, the complete rainfall total as of March 31st. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Question. I have a question. Are, do, oh. How frequently do we revise this? Uh, the water shortage the contingency? The criteria, the contingency. Um, so we do it as pr part of the um, urban plan, and so we will look at revising that for the 2020 urban plan. Because it seems like, uh, I noted this when I first came on board that it was uh, the criteria maybe were sort of based on a kind of a surface water basis that rainfall was absolutely critical from year to year to measure that and then determine the determine whether we're in an emergency phase but we're kind of in a we're in an emergency phase regardless of whether we have a rainy year or a dry year or whatever until we find a supplemental water supply. Um, so I was just was wondering whether there's any need to actually acknowledge that on the urban water. Management. Yeah, so I think our, our water shortage pl a contingency plan keeps evolving further away from more of a surface water model. Um, this, uh, the current plan incorporates recharge with rainfall, so that was a step in the right direction, and I think the next time around, we're actually gonna take a look at some different um, different methodologies, possibly uh, water levels and, and key wells. Um, like protective levels. Protective yeah. levels, and so um, the, the urban plan for 2020 is actually due in 2021, but we're gonna um, go ahead and get started um, probably this coming fiscal year on starting to take a look at that um, and yeah, come up with some ideas. And, and just for historical way. perspective, this was a step I mean, when, when I first came on the board, it was all just completely surface water based. And just yeah, one no. year. Yeah, in one year. So yeah, no, it I was a step and, you know, we added <laughs> things like, well, except for, that's why we have the thing about a groundwater emergency in there too, so that, because, yeah. anyway. So the, the reason why we're not at, at uh, higher stages is because of the big wet year that we had in 2016-17 over 50 inches of rain but all these stages you the can be declared based on either the cumulative yeah. rainfall or groundwater emergency in place right. or there's also some production capacity triggers and so I think that I, well I guess the only reason I do it is I've had uh, been approached by different customers that they're confused right I think and it is confusing. It's raining a lot, and so why are we still in stage three? And I 
firmly support the idea that we are in a stage three water emergency in spite of the rain because of the perilous levels of our groundwater right now. Right. But uh, that we just just maybe to clarify it, make it a little bit more easy to for the average customer to understand. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the rainfall is really a proxy ultimately for protective water elevations, and we know that while we have uh, decent rainfall over that whatever that average is five years, that and our and our customers have been in stage three curtailment and done an excellent job of cutting back although water usage is creeping up, we know uh, that many of the uh, monitoring wells are below protective water levels and still face a significant uh, continuing threat of seawater intrusion. Yeah, okay. Jim, yeah. I would just like to mention that a number of years ago, I requested that we have some kind of public display of where our groundwater levels are below protective levels, and, and Jaffe joined me a few years ago and that's the kind of thing we need for not only that, but for our urban water management plan for this, uh, you know, an, another way to look at, you know, the way the kind of graphic to show how close we are to. Well, we can also use that instead of rainfall or in addition to rainfall to say when we have the emergencies and what kind of cutbacks we need and all that. No, but I meant as far as sh it'd be nice to have some graphic that shows, uh, you know, here's protective levels, here's where we are. Right. You know? I, absolutely. <laughs> Part of the other reason why we've held off on changing anything as we're waiting for the groundwater model to be finished because I think that can really inform the next plan and so now that that's complete or almost complete we'll be able to yeah. to use that and come up with something really solid. So it's not an item we vote on today it's just informational um, just it'll come to us in two weeks to decide where we are. Um, yeah. And I would like to throw in the groundwater model will never be finished. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. But it'll be a useful tool all along. It's already a useful tool. <laughs> <laughs> None of us are finished. It's so worth right? doing. Aren't we works in progress? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes, did you want to comment on the item? Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I would also like to point out to your board that on November 6, 2018, as part of the Raftalis a rate restructuring presentation to your board, they recommended that if you adopted the rate increase structure, that you do away with the stage three emergency rates. You can review that on your November 6th uh, board packet. I remember it because I thought it was odd that. Let me clarify that. You can still be in a stage three for functionally all the ops actions that the district's going to do to try and decrease water use while not putting stage three rates in place. That's they do right. not have to be, you don't have to, we don't have to mess with rates, but we can still ha be in a stage three as far as operationally. Okay. Conservation, well, so that's forth. not clear in that presentation right, that packet. That's the, that's the clarity of that. Okay. Thank you. S so I just think that's interesting. Um, I also um, would like and, and think it would behoove the district to establish the criteria that were used to establish the groundwater emergency in 2014. What, what were those levels and what were the criteria that um, must be met to remove the groundwater emergency stage? I want to remind you that um, Mr. Duncan in a Santa Cruz Sentinel article um, about a year ago said that groundwater levels were at an historic high. So I think it would be good and, and I appreciate your, your t discussion about stages of conservation and their increased funding that um, it brings to the district the higher it goes, you get to charge more money for it, for water. But to link in the stages to the monitoring well levels and really do present a clear and historic picture of those groundwater monitoring well levels throughout, I think you, you, you need to separate those seascape wells, those um, La Selva wells, because they're not in the same aquifer 
they're in the Aromas Red Sands. And those are the ones that always get the big circles on the maps. But it's a different aquifer. And I really think we've got to be focusing here and giving clear information on the Parisma aquifer. Thank you. Let me just make one point. I don't think I'm ever going to be comfortable with a um, going out of a groundwater emergency until we're above protective levels myself. Colonel Terry Maxwell, again, I underscore Ms. Steinbrenner's points entirely. Right. And I point out that what she's exposing is uh, either negligence in collecting your data, Dr. LaHue, or uh, contrived to not present all of the accurate data that might be consistent with Ms. Steinbrenner's point of view. Again, it's disappointing. And it's disappointing to me as a customer that I'm paying for accurate, honest performance by your staff and she points out where that didn't occur. All right, let's go on to item 6.3. Yeah. This is on the advanced metering infrastructure. Yeah. yeah, so at the last board meeting, um, Director Lather requested and the board concurred that we come back with some more follow-up information on the advanced metering infrastructure upgrade project, um, specifically is related to that project's uh, generation of water demand offset credits and water savings that can in turn be purchased by new development applicants um, under our water demand offset program. So um, the specific uh, items of interest um, or concern were uh, whether the water savings from AMI would be recognized soon enough relative to the time in which new demand from new water connections is actually coming online and whether the amount of offset credit approved by the board is conservative enough and protective of the groundwater basin and so um, really to address the first concern, um, the memo lays out the progress that we've made to date on the AMI upgrade. And um, we've noted that we still expect to complete that project within two years. We, um, as noted in the memo, we have a request for proposal out for a contractor to start replacing registers and our schedule calls for um, those bids to be in soon and then for that work to actually begin um, towards the middle to end of May. Um, staff has also been doing some register replacements as time allows um, and getting, getting ready for that. And so um, we feel like uh, we're gonna meet that target still. It could even be sooner. Um, we've given the contractors the option to go ahead and um, place two bids. One is for doing a certain number of register replacements every month that'll get the project complete in two years, and the other is to propose something that will get the project done sooner um, at kind of the double, double the rate of the minimum bid. So we'll see how those bids come in. Um, I'd uh, also like to note that the water savings will begin once we complete phase one, which is the installation of registers within um, about 25% of our service area and the installation of the first base station and repeater that'll be picking up those reads and the software that's paired with that. So once that is completed, which we're hoping to have um, a pretty good start on by the summer and to have that infrastructure in place, we'll be receiving that data um, through the network and staff will be reviewing those leaks as you know, they, they pick up. So the water savings is gonna start much sooner than the completion of the project. It's, it's really gonna be starting as soon as that first phase one is completed. And then as the project expands and we get more registers replaced and meters replaced and more base stations and repeaters installed, it'll be an incremental water savings over time until we get done in, in two years. So I just kinda wanted to add that. Um, so that's, yeah, I think the, the project's moving along pretty well. Um, we have uh, an article in the What's on Tap and uh, we've done started doing some outreach on our website about the project. 
And let's see, moving on to the other issue of concern, which was is the water savings and the amount of credit that was approved, is that conservative enough to protect the groundwater basin? And so we've referenced um, the past uh, board items where we've, we've brought this to you um, for reference, but looking back, um, you approved a 5% water savings and that in itself was pretty conservative based on some of the studies and, and data that we did find which showed that probably 10% was an average um, and some studies went up to 15%. Um, on top of that conservative estimate, the, it was reduced by 50% to account for the specific WDO program criteria of permanence and additionality. So that really resulted in um, 86 acre feet of credit, which uh, we feel is, is really super conservative. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that when we're looking at a project's water demand offset requirement, we're multiplying that by a factor of two. So anytime you see that offset requirement or credits being pulled from the bank, Keep in mind that we're, we're requiring a higher offset than what would be needed to just keep demand level. So it should produce some, uh, you know, another 100% of savings there. Um, and again, I, I already mentioned the leak detection will really start um, as soon as those registers get start getting installed. Okay, moving on. Um, the last thing we have is kind of a summary of uh, the offset credit bank and where that bank stands. And so with the 86 acre feet of credit that uh, the board approved, 31.8 um, acre feet has already been purchased or assigned by applicants. And, and um, some of that was uh, the old grandfathered projects under the, the first water demand offset program. Um, but the majority of it, 27 acre feet, was really backlog from people that um, were on our, our kind of our second program, which was the waitlisted program. So that's ended and we expect that the rate of new applications is, is will now return to its normal frequency. Um, so again, the 31.8 acre feet of credit represents, half of that really represents the new demand and it has a two time multiplier embedded. Um, another thing to consider is that applicants have, um, that have purchased credits are not expected to use water for another one to four years, especially if they're in that wait list category um, because of the amount of time that it takes to get through the land use planning process. And, and um, what we found is that for the most common development types that we have in our district, single family homes and accessory dwelling units, it's taking almost three years from the time that they apply with us to the time that they actually start using. So there's a lag there. While we get AMI going, we'll be recognizing savings before a lot of those projects even start using water. So that kind of sums up um, the AMI project and the water demand offset credits related to that. So we're looking for any alternate direction if you have any, or um, can it certainly answer any questions that you might have. Questions, we a couple of questions. So the the um, the first phase is going to is going to be uh, completed this summer. So we'll be starting to get information about how many leaks are detected and yes, and and approximately how many. Um, hookups is that where we'll be getting information? So about 25% I think is somewhere around 3,000 services, okay. yeah. That's quite a bit. And then another question is, is just on the reevaluation. Can you remind me, I, I recall that we were gonna reevaluate whether or not the, the actual savings that are uh, realized or how they compare to the projected savings. And that was, I remember that happening at half the, the, um, the amount of credits. But I see here it's mm. at 25 acre feet. 
Um, yeah, so what you, what you said was um, when we had sold, the, when that 86 acre feet that we initially started with mm -hmm. got down to 25 acre feet, you wanted us to raise the red flag and come back and you would reevaluate um, any future will serve applications from that point on, um, not wanting to get into a deficit situation. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll okay. certainly, we, we keep bringing that back as part of the will serve approvals. There's a table, um, I think it's attachment one or two, where we are giving a um, breakdown of, of the balance of the bank with the applications that are on that night's agenda. And that's also covered um, basically here. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. No questions? Public? Anyone in public? I have some direction. Hmm? I'd like to give direction in my motion. Okay. Right. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner. Director Lather, I was hoping to hear from you because I remember you're losing sleep over this. <laughs> I hope you'll speak up. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. I've been curious about this too, and it bothers me a lot um, because it seems sort of like a smoke and mirrors thing. Um, Ms. Flock, you did say that water demand offset is at two times the, um, the projected use, but in item 6.1.1, that customer is only being charged um, a water demand offset factor of 1.6. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not 2.0, at least in this case. And um, I also w would like a bit of an explanation on uh, page 57. The offset in, total offset in is 105.3 acre feet. The offsets out is 51.1. Um, so I, I'm just confused about the number. I, I, I think I understand that what is yet available to approve and hand out is 54.2 acre feet. But I'm really nervous too because um, your water demand offset criteria for projects to use the money that people pay had these, um, these issues. First, the water savings must be measurable. I don't see anything really in here. It's an estimate, it's a percentage, it's a conservative percentage, but it's not measurable. So to me, using the smart meters as a way to qualify for water demand offset projects doesn't meet that criteria because it's not measurable. The second um, criteria was that it had to have a 20 year life. I don't think the smart meters meet that criteria either. And the third was that it would not have been done otherwise. This does not meet your criteria because you had in your budget already money, over a million dollars I think it was, to install smart meters so you've shifted it into the water demand offset and now suddenly there are 86 acre feet a year to hand out to people and sell to people and bring in money. <laughs> but I'm not seeing this as a really effective way that you're meeting your own criteria and really addressing any water increase in demand. Although I have been heartened to see in the graphs of production that your production is down even though the number of services Thank connections you. is up. Thank you. Um, you want to address a couple of those? Because I, I can address, I mean, one is the the 20 year um, expected lifetime. That's why the amount estimated was cut in half is because we figured mm -hmm. it was only 10 years. The other thing is that um, the project wouldn't have gotten started for 10 years. And as far as measurable, we're, we have estimates now, but it is a measurable difference in the amount of water used by customers that we'll be able to analyze and see how it's done. Does that cover those? Okay. And the um, table in attachment one is a historical perspective, so it includes offsets generated from 
all recent projects, including the AMI projects, so toilet rebates, the NODES hydrant flushing machine, and some of the school plumbing retrofits that we've done. So it, it's a combination and a historical perspective versus what's been sold. Okay, thank you. Mr. Maxwell. Colonel, actually, um, like your title, I've earned it. And, and I've also earned an informed view about the performance of the Soquel Creek Water Board and its directors for the past. Can you keep your comments to the AMI project, okay. please? Yeah. And on, on the project, I find the Steinbrenners, um, if you will, puzzlement more than convincing than what the staff reports. Uh, in addition to that, the smoke and mirrors comment is adequate many times presented here by this board and by your staff and certainly by your consultants. Um, on, so I think you get, need to do a better job of being forthcoming with all of the AMI information data. Um, one comment on Ms. Lather is asking to be your approval to run up for the LAFCO board. I find that a terrible conflict of interest because uh, the consolidation of- This has to do with this item, I'm sorry, but you're off base. Okay, all right. Well then, before I go, I would like to challenge her. You're, you're committing terrible conflict of interest regarding LAFCO. Okay, but that's nothing because to do with- Because you guys that was, that was on the consent the agenda, consideration that was another agenda item. Okay. You have no right bringing that right now. And just to make it clear, I represented LAFCO for the last four years, I represented the district for LAFCO, and that is actually the way it works. You have a district member from a fire district or a water district or a recreational district that is nominated and then runs for election and is elected by all 24 of these special districts in the county. There you go. So you're asking for guidance in the form of a motion? If you have any alternate direction than what you've already directed already staff to do. Before. Well, I'd like to put some teeth into looking at the data. So I don't know, is six months a reasonable amount of time, do you think, after the, the project <coughs> comes online <coughs> to have a first look? Sure, yeah. that would make okay. me feel better. Okay, so I'd like I'd to make, second the, that motion. I'd make the motion that, <laughs> yeah. that uh, you bring back to the board after six months, uh, f six months after completion of phase one, uh, an analysis of what you're seeing in terms of leaks and the trends. And, and tr yeah, trends. Yeah, I'll I'll let you determine what's in that analysis. Yeah, but it, but sure. it, how it pertains to to water savings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was there a second? Or? I did. I seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Yeah. Good. And then something that, that I think that beyond water leaks, I actually think this could affect our um, pe how people use water through awareness. And sure. I, I don't think it's ready for a motion yet, but unless other directors think so, but I'd, I'd like to see as soon as it's feasible an application developed mm -hmm. so that people can see what water they're using. That's part of it. Yeah. They, they should be able to have an app as part of this whole There program. is an app, and we're trying to kind of plan for when we're going to be implementing that. Um, that'll be a little bit further down the road. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, part well, of then no need for a motion. I'll just, just mention to reaffirm that. one other thing, because it's something that's been asked for before, it's just that we still want to have some way to alert the public when they see a building site being built that says that this amount of water use in this development is being offset mm -hmm. by such so much percent. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, we now move to item 6.4. That's why. Sorry, you did that? Yeah, you're right. Hi. Oh, yeah. Hey. I'm pleased to bring you tonight the um, 2018 Consumer Confidence Water Quality Report. Um, it's in draft form for your questions and comments. Um, we would appreciate your feedback. And as always, um, the big takeaway with the Consumer Confidence Report is that our water that we've served our customers um, has met all state and federal standards. Um, 
this year's consumer confidence report format has not changed very much from last year's. It's pretty much the same. We've um, included all the required elements, um, water system information, sources of water, all the specified language for the definitions, and the reported levels of the detected compounds. Those are listed in the um, 2018 water quality table. Um, and compliance with other drinking water regulations and any required educational information like um, specific language such as um, lead and um, I think mostly lead. Nitrate. So before I, sorry I lost my place. I'm going to point out a few typos, corrections, because I know um, there's usually a few in there. So first of all, I wanted to point out on page three of the report, which is page 62 of the board packet, on the bottom left, it's supposed to say source water quality, and we're, right. gonna, we're going not to fix sour. that. <laughs> not, not sour <laughs> water quality. <laughs> um, and then just as a few little minor um, capitals and lowercase corrections that need to be done and in this year's this year's compilation of the data included um, the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule 4 which consisted of um, two metals um, sampling these this sampling was um, <coughs> based on assessment monitoring in two two distinct um, uh, monitoring efforts that were collected six months apart. So um, what we did was we collected at the entry point to the distribution system for two metals, nine pesticides, three alcohols, and three semi-volatile organic compounds. And then in the distribution system, we collected um, the brominated Haloacetic acids, um, the HA5s, HAA6s, and the HAA9. And um, I'm pleased to report that we did not have anything show up except for above the um, method reporting limit, except for one butanol, which was um, detected at two sources. And when the follow up sampling was done on the second round, those samples were non detect. So and um, and then the germanium is um, one of the metals that is not is unregulated right now, but we also um, we found detections of that. So um, other than that, we ha we did not have any lead and copper sampling. That's going to happen in this summer in 2019. The triennial lead and copper monitoring and we have moved forward with lead sampling in schools, but the lead sampling in schools in 2018, we did not collect any samples, but we have collected some for 2019. So yeah, that's why you'll see the 2017 data presented in the report. And uh, other than that, I'd appreciate any questions or comments, any feedback you have. Yes. About the germanium thing, I see <coughs> the range of detection is non-detect to 1.7, and the average is 0.39. Right. And I don't know how to get an average higher than the maximum. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on there. The the max was 1.7, but the average because the okay, so the maximum so was 1.7. That was 1.7. The other one's 0.39. And then okay. point. All right. So I guess point. that's possible. Well, it, which brings up and a point. Is there any way that can be in black and or is that is that gray type or? I'll or I can I can check with Becca on that. Um, just the, just the fonts just to me a little hard to very read. Thin. Yeah, it's just very very thin. thin. Okay, that's that's good <laughs> feedback. I can bring that back. I also wanted to ask about iron. I see the maximum we've seen is two thirty. Yes. And for me, that's kind of close to the max, which is three hundred. So. What was that 
that hit about? So that hit is um, Madeline Well um, and It doesn't have treatment. It go. I mean, it gets chlorinated and goes into the distribution system. It also pumps directly up to a, a tank, so it's not going straight into the distribution system. But um, you know, I just collected a sample there uh, for this <coughs> first quarter of 2019, and it came back at 200. So, I mean, it's yeah, it, g it went up to 230, but it's it's still it's not it's not approaching 300. So we're Okay. We're okay there. Yeah, we're. I just don't like to see it even close to the maximums because a little glitch and we're over, and then we have to report it and tell the customers, and it becomes a big hullabaloo. And I, I like to make it be lower. So I, I maybe I ask to see about that getting investigated a little bit to see why that's happening and if there's anything we can do to make it just go away. Yeah. Might have more Carl, to is, add. That, is that a secondary MCL? Yeah, that is yeah. a that is a secondary aesthetics. MCL. Um, so it's only based on aesthetics and not health um, issues. And if you do go over, it's a compliance is based on a quarterly annual average. So, and there would be no um, the only reporting that would be necessary would be in the consumer confidence confidence report. So it wouldn't be like a primary violation where okay. we'd have to okay. do a mailer. Um, and that is, and that well does, sometimes it does go up into the 200, sometimes it's lower, but um, we can't do anything about it unless we put in expensive treatment or take that well offline. And it's going to be needed for the um, Pure Water SoCal project. So. Okay. Any other? We yeah, just had a Carly. quick question, and that was, um, did you, you know, did you have any separate uh, reporting on the city, the intertie, the exchange, the water exchange that some of the customers got? Oh, which are thank you. Thank you for, um, so we, what we did was we put a link in here to the city's water quality, um, and that was something that the Department of um, Division of Drinking Water, Monterey Division, they um, have, instead of adding the city of Santa Cruz's entire water quality table, they yeah. we can have a link to their water quality data. So we have that as a separate entity. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it was in the isolated zone and it was partially blended with some of the wells that were online. So but I understood. Right. So it was, um, you know, but and it was for one month of December 2018. But so what was your concern, Carla? Oh, just the reporting whether, well, because this is a water quality for district customers. Yeah. And I was just wondering where that w information would be for those customers. Is yeah, well there's a, l um, a hyperlink on the electronic version. We are planning to deliver this electronically this year as well um, with billing inserts in the May bills and the customers, um, if they request a paper copy, they will send it to them. So did you did you analyze that the city's data at the same time as? Oh, sorry. I said, uh, did you analyze the city's data in comparison to our data? Their water quality report isn't finished. The last time I looked, their 2018 data isn't there, and I didn't request any data from them, so I have not made a comparison. Okay. But we, I mean, we've been extensively looking we have a water quality monitoring program going on right now during the water transfer where we're looking at distribution sites as well as the water coming in from the inner tie so we have a lot of that data and that's going to be a, a further down the line a report to the board um, and to our customers based on that water quality itself that's all, that's all I okay yeah. <laughs> i wasn't trying to put you on the spot yeah no it's just it's just not it, it's not going to be included as part of the mm -hmm. water the consumer confidence report it will be included in, in next year's, right? Because you'll be capturing in that blended zone? I believe so. And because it's also for a, lo a lengthier time period, it's going to go through you know, January through April. So um, we'll have to go back to DDW and see how they'll you know, want us to express that in our report. But I believe it'll be more extensive than this um, small capture of about one month of <laughs> water transfer. <laughs> yeah. OK. Any other questions from the board? Okay. 
Any public comment? Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I'm sorry, um, I had a bit of discussion with my, my friend. So I think you were discussing the source of this halo acetic acid and that it was from the surface water. Is that what oh no, you were saying? It's present in, uh, in all water systems. Small water system? In all water systems. All water systems, okay. It's present in there at various concentrations. All right. Thank you. So the disinfection byproducts are higher in surface water because there's more uh, organic matter. Yes, that I understand. But I was surprised to see um, on page 65 of the packet that um, the one butanol uh, came up. And thank you. you. You said that it was just sort of a, a spike, unexplained spike, which is odd in groundwater. Um, but also the haloacetic acids, the two of them there have uh, levels that are, these appear to be not regulated. Under the MCL it says NA, so they're not regulated, they must be. But in your data collected for year tested 2018, you had some levels reported in the groundwater. So um, I thought that was interesting. and. Also, um, I wanted to point out the uh, 1, 2, 3 TCP level being rather high. When the MCL level is 5.0 in 2018, um, your wells detected 5.6 to 8.0 um, with an average amount of 6.9 above the MCL. And I thought that the uh, well that was the main source of that contaminant had been turned off. It so it has. Thank you for confirming that. So these are just levels that are seeping in from the agricultural use and the other era contaminant sources. Well, let me let Carla answer that one because I think we should be clear okay. on that. Okay. And, and does, uh, I don't see MTBE on here at all. I, th I thought that that should be tested for. Um, and um, I guess finally, I want to point out that um, on page 67, <laughs> something rather curious, it says, the presence of contaminants does not necessarily indicate the water poses a health risk. <laughs> That's a very odd statement to me and I think uh, should maybe be rephrased or uh, explained a little better. I also want to point out that at the uh, near the O'Neill well, there is uh, a newly discovered uh, series of underground storage tanks at the Wilson Tire. Significant amount of tanks there that could be affecting or potentially affecting the O'Neill well. So I urge you to be on the lookout for those plumes. Hey, thank you. Carla, can you just clear up the one, two, three TCP? I'd like to clarify those points starting um, backwards. I guess um, the statement on page 67 with the drinking water, including bottled water, that is verbatim. The state um, from the reference manual has insisted that that be put in here verbatim. So um, the presence of contaminants does not necessarily indicate the water poses a health risk is a statement that is That's true. That's a state statement. And it's, <laughs> it's required. And it's, yeah. and it's true because you might have a public health goal, but then you have an MCL. There's lots of different levels. So just because something is in the water and it's detectable does not necessarily mean that it poses a, he a health risk. Um, I'll go backwards to the 123 TCP comment. Um, that, that portion of the table, if you read the top, um, it is Country Club Well and it's a standby source and it was not used in 2018. And those four sample, those those range of detections were from four samples collected on a quarterly basis, and um, we just turn the well on and, and pump pump to waste. It actually, um, the water gets used for beneficial reuse down by the um, the golf course when we when we pump that well for sampling, and um, so that well is not has not been used since about I believe July of 2017 and not at all in 2018 it did, it did not pump into the distribution system um, I believe the comment on the halo acetic acids there's nine acids that are 
considered um, in the whole realm of a haloacetic acid, you have you know, bromochloro, bromodichloro, dibromochloro, all the different combinations of the chloro and the bromo. So the state only in the, in the feds, they regulate the haloacetic acids that are the, the five, the HAA5, which is at the top of the table. Um, those are the regulated HAAs. The other, and, and I, the comment was that they, they were in groundwater. Well, um, again, this, and we can maybe make a footnote, these haloacetic acids from the UCMR monitoring are from treated water, so, and they're from the distribution system. So um, they are go we are going to see disinfection byproducts, um, and they are unregulated. And this, again, is this, this is the federal government getting a good handle on what's out there. This is why they do UCMR. They want to see what's out there and what um, occurrence data they can collect. Um, as far as the one butanol, the, the two sites that, um, that came up were collected on the same day. They were on the same sample run at the lab. I looked back um, to see, I thought maybe it was some kind of a laboratory error. We actually had a third sample that was on that same batch that was run through the lab that did not have a hit for <coughs> one butanol. Um, again, the, the one butanol, the reference concentration is 700, and I'll just, I'll, I'll read you a little bit of what a, a reference concentration is um, as part of the UCMR, so you can kind of get a handle on the, and I know it's in the first part here. Um, My apologies. So, reference concentrations are health based and provide context for the detection of a UCMR contaminant. They do not represent regulatory limits or action levels and should not be interpreted as an indication that the agency, meaning the EPA, intends to establish a future drinking water regulation. So, again, this is monitoring that is done on an assessment basis to see what is out there and this is these are non-regulated um, constituents and we would expect that some of them are going to be found a lot of these laboratory method um, detection limits are super low so they're going to find stuff because they're looking for it at that really 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 low level so i believe i answered all of your questions you did a great job thank, thank you thank you, thank you. Okay. Any other comments on the report? Just the minor. I agree with the font, and if it's <laughs> possible to pick a font, or you know the darker color, that makes it easier to see where the decimal place is, because I those difficult. The sometimes. tiny decimal points. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's if there is such a font. <laughs> I mean, it make it clearer. All right. Um, so we can move on then. Correct? Or does that require any? Approval. That was just think so. guidance. Okay. So community water plan would be the next item, 6.5. Oh, sure. Hi, good evening. I have a, just a couple slides I want to walk us through. Also just want to say happy birthday to Ron tonight. Ron? <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll sing to you later. 28, mm. feeling good. <laughs> So the item tonight is item 6.5, which is uh, a couple slides and discussion that we'd like, staff would like to have with the board related to the community water plan, the components within it, and also an upcoming 2019 uh, community water plan progress update that the district would like to put out. Again, this is slide here is just kind of a history and background related to how the community water plan evolved. Um, basically, again, starting in 2007, the district embarked on evaluating desalination with the city of Santa Cruz over that six to seven year period. We did a lot of evaluation feasibility. But in 2013, uh, the project evaluation on that supplemental water supply uh, was halted and led the district to go into a 13th month process to reevaluate re water supply options. At that time, we even considered it a backup option because we weren't sure if the city was going to want to start again the desal. Concluding in that step uh, process, 
we evolved and got a lot of community input that drove us to looking at water supply options to create the community water plan. And through that, as you can see here, we did workshops, we had public surveys, and we evaluated water supply options through a criteria-based analysis. In 2015, the district did adopt um, the community water plan, which is shown here. It was this larger document that summarized um, the multifaceted roadmap that the district wanted to participate and partake in to lead us to basin reliability and sustainability. And really, that focused on our community values. So through that survey process, we did identify that we really wanted to focus on timeliness, water quality, and reliability. That was also around the same time that the district embarked and adopted a strategic plan that incorporated our goals and values and our guiding principles. And so in 2015, uh, through this process, we um, identified conservation, groundwater management, and the evaluation of three water supplies. We knew that the evaluation phase was gonna take some time again. So in 2015, the board said, let's prioritize and evaluate water purification for groundwater replenishment using recycled water, um, exploring river water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz, and still keeping a, um, a watchful eye on desalination that was occurring through a private entity in Moss Landing. Again, the board set a goal of having a project come online in 2022, um, and then trying to aim towards the sustainability by 2040. In 2017, we uh, put out um, a progress update, and this is the one right here that I'm showing. And this one gave an update related to those five components, and it also included in this update um, the, addition of an, uh, the addition of stormwater capture as a supplemental water supply that we were evaluating. And that we recognized still in 2017, we were still in, a, in an evaluation process. Um, the board was very clear that no final determination had been um, selected on any water supply option. We were still evaluating them. And we also recognized that in 2017 uh, that there had been some, some milestones or actions that have occurred s specifically with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that uh, was a statewide mandate that the basin be brought back into balance. Prior to that, it was something that the state was looking at, but it was codified uh, between these two um, progress update reports. At this point, um, you know, we come to the board and um, as staff, we go out a lot, and I know the board members do as well, out to the community. Outreach and communication of what we're doing has been uh, one of the main things in terms of getting out to the people, getting out to the, uh, our community for them to understand what we're doing. Our water supply process is very complex, um, and there's a lot of information out there. So we really try to focus on explaining what we're doing and what the current update is on those things. I would like to point out, while it's not in a slide, we at the meeting we went to last night, this was the city's update. So they are also kind of doing this kind of outreach to their customers, sharing with them this is their update for uh, 2018 related to their water supply strategies. For us, our focus is obviously um, a lot on where our water supply options are take a snapshot of 2019, there has been a lot of progress that has been made on all fronts, uh, specifically with the Pure Water Soquel project in 2018. The board did um, complete and certify the environmental review of the project. They approved the project and we are now going forward with seeking grant funding, low interest loans, and preliminary design. In terms of excess uh, river water purchase, I think we talked a lot about it earlier today with the update from the city's water commission. Um, we also are have an ongoing pilot project that um, we are gonna be going through December of 2020. It's the staff from both agencies have been coordinating quite a bit and I think we'll be ne meeting next week and as identified in the staff report, we are gonna be talking a lot more, not just about, you know, 
whether or not it's about the volume, but it's about the water quality, and it's about the assurance of reliability in terms of operational considerations. Just in these last couple months of this pilot transfer, we've had to turn it off a couple times related to fish flows. Um, we have had some detections of water quality and other constituents that we're going to have to consider as the board um, looks to um, see what they want to do with that water transfer. Again, in the long-term process for the excess river water purchase or the water transfer, uh, the city has been pretty clear about what you guys have identified. There isn't enough water. Um, what, what kind of instances do we want to participate in putting that into our long-range plan? Will be things, I think, that are ongoing, but for our update at this point, we may want to just keep it more high level in that this is more of an and project that we do see as regional collaboration. Then we still have the other two options that um, the board has identified for our community water plan, which is desalination and stormwater capture. Uh, we did communicate with representatives from deep water desal and um, the bullet points that are contained in the staff memo give their current status of the project. They um, feel as though they have completed most of these uh, feasibility and technical studies to inform the environmental review. Um, they are in the process right now of working with regulators in terms of the needs that they feel that I guess the state has identified as being still unfulfilled in terms of feasibility of evaluating the intake. So they are working through some of those um, steps with them. So at this point, the environmental review process um, is on hold and uh, their project is still going forward, but it's not going forward yet at the pace that they had er originally anticipated. In terms of the stormwater capture, I think um, Shelley provided the information that's in the staff memo for that item. Again, stormwater capture is something that the board identified and asked staff to include in 2017 as a water supply option. We do include this and explain that this is small scale projects. Um, the the location of them, the evaluation of them was, were, were things that staff worked with the county on over the last two years. And there are some there is some potential, but again, these are a little bit smaller in scale. So in terms of communicating with our customers, we feel, staff feels it is a good time for us to continue to go forward and put out a 2019 community progress report to identify and capture the status of the projects thus far. And also to um, really kind of, I, I think, hit on these main points. Let me just talk about them. First, I think the district board has always said, and we continue to try to be very factual and include information that is based on science and technical information and studies. Uh, we also want to continue to make sure that we're corroborating with partner agencies. Again, it's very important that we're using the information that is generated by other agencies, especially if they're an agency such as the city, on their water supply options. Um, while a lot of community people want us to, you know, take information from other options or alternatives, if the city, again, I think if the city doesn't uh, want to incorporate that into their water supply alternatives, it's really hard for us to communicate that if it's not something coming from them. So we have been working with them and they review our materials as they go out. Again, I think we want to be adaptable to the community interest. Um, there's certain topics that come out some time to time that uh, need focus and need attention. So we do try to make sure that if there's a topic or a question or maybe an, a, a a concern, we do try to make sure that we include that in our material. We also continue to want to clarify misinformation, and I think a community progress report um, will do that. It's, it's hard for us in terms of outreach to hit all of the pertinent materials that are out there that people want to use. So this item here is something that we do uh, would send out, not this one, sorry, that's the city's, <laughs> this one. <laughs> would be something that we're going to put out in hard copy. It's also something that we can put out um, in mailboxes. So we are proposing that this be mailed. And again, um, the information contained therein also has to provide that local, regional, and statewide context. Uh, we do want to share that a lot of things that are driven here are based on local policy, but also statewide policies. And then, 
I think, um, as has been since uh, the first generation of the 2015 Community Water Plan Report, is that we want to stay aligned to our community values and our board's guiding principles, and that there is a path forward. So in terms of what we would include or what we're proposing to include in the 2019 progress report, first I think I wanna just state that we do have our standing committees that we uh, utilize and leverage a lot, and Larry, who's in the audience tonight, is, is on one of them. But we do have com uh, these committee meetings th uh, upcoming that we will be going back and forth with them in terms of generating what kind of information and material you wanna share with our customers. But in terms of what happened in 2017 to 2019, I think it's important for us to share that the Sky 10 results uh, and the findings from that reiterated and confirmed that seawater intrusion is not just occurring at both ends of the basin, but that it is at the coastline all throughout. Uh, we also wanna talk a little bit more on the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and their upcoming milestones. As you know, that was a declaration by the state um, I know there was a question earlier today related to the declaration of the groundwater emergency. When the board did approve that in 2014, that was based on our local hydrologist and a peer review. Since then, we are one of 21 basins in California identified as critically overdrafted. So it's important for people to understand that this is not you know, something that just locally we're illustrating and seeing, but it's the state is seeing that. And so we need to explain that to our customers. It's also not about water levels, it's also about the water quality. And so I think that's another thing in terms of the information that we need to share. Um, we have seen, and I think, uh, Ron, if you wanted to talk about the all-time high comment, or do you want me to? Well, I, I think that goes back to clarifying misinformation. You know, I think in a big picture, let me just segue out and then you can come back in. What, we're, what I think Melanie's leading up to is not only updating with the most pertinent information, scientific-based information, but trying to present it, what do we let go of, what do we include to make it as simple and as easy and digestible and genuine to our uh, customers as possible. Uh, you know, an example of how easy it is for people to misconstrue stuff um, for whatever reasons is th the comment that I did make to the Sentinel, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, where water levels are they were at a all-time high. And I think the reporter did a good job of catching that, but the second part didn't get incorporated. And that was, e they are at an all-time high because of the great conservation by our customers. And even with that effort, uh, we're still well below sustainable levels uh, to prevent seawater intrusion. And our hydrologists showed that. So it's, you know, if you tell part of the story, it can get taken out of context. So keeping it simple, and uh, not too much because people uh, tend to take what works for them. And so trying to work that in con and, and keep it concise. Thank, Thank you. And then in terms of the four water supply options, um, in the past we've given equal kind of layout on the page to the water supply options for pure water SoCal and surface water and then desalination stormwater capture um, got about half the page size. Um, we are, I am asking for a little bit of input from the board in terms of our water supply options and how we communicate that out to the community. Uh, Pure Water Soquel, we can, we can describe that the project is defined now with a tertiary component down in Santa Cruz. The, we are going forward with design of the treatment purification facility at Chanticleer. Um, conveyance pipelines and the recharge wells at the identified three locations, Willowbrook, Monterey, and uh, off Cabrillo College Drive. And we can also talk about surface water transfer in terms of continuing to evaluate with the city of Santa Cruz and seeing what water is available uh, from them and that we are still interested in that. Desalination stormwater capture and would like feedback from the board on how we want to uh, explain and share that. And I also want to kind of get a better understanding from the board if they would like us to go into like project details related to cost or anticipated timelines for the projects to come online. I would propose we take desal completely out of our plan. Okay, and, and can I just mm -hmm. take a second? So yeah, and that's the kind of thing, that's the information we're looking at. Um, I think, I mean, I think we would probably 
concur that's not a, a bad idea or put it you know in a, a different category at a minimum I mean when we show this currently to people and this is what we had you know what I ask is this painting the best best picture we can for our customers you know they don't have a lot of time to digest this so if you look at this you might think you know you've got three supply options that are all equal and we're not sure that's it's not it's it's that's not. correct you know anymore at least uh, so, and stormwater capture is not even on here, and, and I'm not sure it should be. Why it's important, and it may be the 100 year, 150 year plan. I, I believe we ought to continue with that. Should it, it's on, a, it's it's on, on our, our update. You know, should we take, you know, should we rearrange these or show them smaller or put them in a, another category? That's what we're wrestling with. That we can come back with ideas, but we want to just kind of get your sentiment on that. I mean, I think that, you know, how, however, that whether even those icons are on the front or not, I think you, it's what, how much you put about each thing. You need to explain in more detail the project that we're proceeding with than you do about, you know, something like stormwater capture. Like, here's a, a little blip about what what we're working on, and the county's working with us. And here's, and then with this, you know, with the water transfer with the city, a little more than that because that's something that's ongoing and we're using. But um, deep water detail, a footnote. Or something that you know, that's still. I mean, they're not even to their EIR. I mean, I mean, most people are going to read, you know, maybe a couple of pages, and that's all. That's so, if you, yeah. I mean, if I see that, I, you know, they read the Sky Tim, they might read the first part of the Sustainable Ground, and that'll be it. So they'll miss the stuff we really want them to know. Right, and that's exactly what we're trying to zero in. on. If they want to get more in depth, we can go. We can point them to reports later if somebody's that. But trying to capture that ninety percent of the audience that. Um, it's just being accurate with yeah. what we're working yeah, and accurate. on, you know. <laughs> that's anybody else? No. Okay. Okay. I would uh, rely upon our outreach committee pretty heavily on this. Okay. Does the does the board want it? Um, I guess for explaining what our water supply options are and making sure I have the direction right. Do we want to keep all four in and just kind of reference that the uh, that desalination and stormwater capture are not as high a priority? Do you want to set a priority? Do you just want to leave all four? Uh, Dr. Daniels had mentioned taking desal off. I think just a little bit more clarity on that direction would be helpful. Well, <coughs> that's wha uh, what do others think about that? Well, I don't think either desal or the stormwater capture are on the table anymore. Um, this is the immediate table. I think in future in future uh, updates, we'll we may be reintroducing <laughs> those or some other options or some other completely different plan. But right now, they are not saving water. I mean, they're not a water project for us. So, I, I thought we were working with seascape. We are. County, county. We are working on some stormwater capture. Um, so I think, th I think I that think that is in the plan. But when you look at it in terms of uh, volume relative to other volumes, it's it's a small, uh, I think small amount. So that's what we're. I think clarifying volume is okay. fine. Okay. You know, okay. say we want to look at all. I mean, we 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 want to look at all the portfolio that we technically could use. If we're going to try and keep doing something with the city transfer, it's not going to be enough. We know where the majority of our efforts are going with something that can really make a difference with sewer water. Um, I I don't is desal even possible anymore? I I, I, I think we can't see it. We basically footnote it, and then maybe I think we're all in the same way. And, and stormwater capture saying, hey, this is a uh, it, ha it it has several nexuses. Stor you know, cleans up stormwater runoff. It it can recharge your groundwater a little bit. It's not a cure, but it's something that I think to honor uh, I Director Lathrop. still be in there. Yeah. We yeah, just, agree. It's we're just we're small. continue to <laughs> evolve that <laughs> process. Yeah, people see all this flooding and they wonder why we're not looking at that water. We should be. Yeah. The amount of effort should be with the amount of volume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so proportional. <laughs> <laughs> proportional. Okay. That's right. To me, it's more of a research project than a development project. Th that's what my point is, too. And, it's oh, and also, the way it might succeed at Seascape is that it's a flood control project, which is very desirable, but it's not. Have to be a it's county not project, a solution right. to it is most what our water supply right. needs are. That's all. 
and we're working with the county, but the county's probably you know right. we are taken over Shelley's a lot of that. We just we're in and contact I think clarifying that, though, we're still trying to encourage that kind of thing. Um, but and we're hoping to pull in other departments from the county. I mean, it's really public works, you know, would be a good um, agency to be or a good department to be involved in that because they have the stormwater quality objectives and they have the flooding issues. So kind of trying to bring some other folks together I mean, to get a, that a done. A footnote about desalvage to the, you know, something that didn't meet the requirements of timeliness and reliability <laughs> that what the community was looking for. You know, it's it's gonna I don't know when that would ever happen. Yeah, so, so do you want to take it off or just leave it on and footnote it? We would not put any logos on there. I would just put a note about yeah. that you know we were considering mm -hmm. that, but still it's just still in the very early early developmental stage. Just put a ghost image of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and maybe explain uh, stormwater capture is one we think will will evolve and gain what? traction over time. Sure. Yeah. It's well a you long think so, but I don't. <coughs> okay. Well, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be so expensive that you know we could go to Sears and buy more or <laughs> the grocery store and buy more water than that for cheaper. Well, we'll continue to explore and, and so do. So in all of these things, not only the the advantages but also the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Just be have it be balanced and factual. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are downsides to everything. Yep. And if if we paint a picture that there's no downsides, I think that people are going to say, "What are they trying to to pull over on us?" But I would use most of the space for pure water because I think that's the thing people need to know more about now. Okay. Like for I example, agree. water quality. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, and if you're, yeah, there's if you're a lot to, to clarify this, about that. Then I would emphasize the two like the like the kind of data that we just got are tonight. in the news right now is that you know the water transfers and pure water for Cal, mm -hmm. and those are the going to generate the most questions. And I still say you know we're looking we were looking at 2015 and 2017 the progress report on this. The things can go back in, but we should explain what happened with the the research project into stormwater ca capture, but we don't need to go into a full page of detail. Yeah. That's my opinion. And the desal is the same way. That is more of an, I don't know what's going on with it, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not anything that we're putting energy into any longer. So we should explain that. Yeah, kind of our evolution. I heard that the, the information we, we heard from the city last night kind of showing that there's not sufficient water. This is okay. I think yeah, the clear points that people were talking about from the meeting last night and from from the GSP meeting that shows, you know, how these projects can work together and you you kind of have to have okay. pure water SoCal. I think that information is really important to get out to people. And the points you've made about Live Oak too, that they're using 25% of you know the water there, and th and it's going to help with that area as well. Okay. okay. Okay, great. great. So we will work with the committees and we'll try and bring a progress report draft to the board and Thank you. Great. That's yeah. really important. Yeah. Good. It's important On to the public, especially. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Uh, we have updated stuff. Public comment? Yes, public comment on this topic. Dr. LaHue, you and I agree on one thing. The entire portfolio, to use your word, the entire portfolio should be considered seriously and honestly. The entire portfolio should be presented as information to your customers and implicit stockholders and anyone else who will rely on the accuracy of what you're reporting. So I would urge that stormwater capture and desal, because it remains a legitimate possible alternative if one would consider small micro-sized desal. Uh, solar locations given we have the Pacific Ocean here and that is a prospective prospect. In addition there's a desal activity going on uh, uh, south of here uh, at the power plant. In fact the former dir executive director or manager of Soquel Creek Water District facilities and activities is down there working. So let's not write it all off. But DC, it's a legitimate alternative. Stormwater capture especially. The fact that you're just now discussing it with the Santa Cruz County Public Works aghast me. You are 10 to 15 years too late in taking that initiative, madam. 
I'm a, again, why? Anything else about the there, report? There's an, that, I find that negligent. You haven't discussed Anything that Anything else about earlier. the report? On the report, by all means, list all the alternatives, list them comprehensively and adequately, and take out less propaganda pushing pure water SoCal and more fact and reality about all of the other alternatives in the portfolio. Thank you. Good evening, Tom Stumbaugh, Aptos. Um, in the section that you just finished, there was a heading called communicating with customers. And the first, uh, first thing it said about that was be factual. Uh, in your publications, you never identify pure water SoCal as treated sewage. This is not factual, as it will not be pure water. Well, the I products mean, of wastewater. Me, Mr. Mr. Stumba, I mean, I've looked at the documents, and it clearly states that it's wastewater that's treated. Okay, it's not coming as raw wastewater anywhere near. Well, the I, I, I guess it's I don't see those documents well, there's a because huge, I haven't read that. There's a huge visual that. there, too, that points out wastewater. You're taking up my time. Treated well, wastewater is question. what's printed right here. The Treated products wastewater. of wastewater treatment have been found to contain trace amounts of antibiotic-resistant DNA. These products are often reintroduced, reintroduced into the environment and water supply potentially resulting in the spread of antibiotic resistance. As such, researchers at the University of Southern California, by Turby School of Engineering, have been studying the development of these potentially harmful and dangerous genes in wastewater treatment processes. Their findings published in Environmental Science and Technology indicate that even low concentrations of just a single type of antibiotic leads to resistance to multiple classes of antibiotics. We're quickly getting to a scary place that's called a post-antibiotic world where we can no longer fight infections with antibiotics anymore because microbes have adapted to be resilient against these, those in, uh, antibiotics. Said Adam Smith, uh, assistant professor of civil engineering and engineering at USC and lead investigator of the study. Unfortunately, engineered water treatment systems end up being sort of a hotbed for antibiotic resistance. In an even more dire scenario, small amounts of antibiotic resistant bacteria and free floating DNA make it through the filtration membrane and come out the other side of the treatment plant in what is called the effluent or the water stream that leads the facility. Thanks. Okay, so just clarifying that's wastewater treatment and not advanced purification. That, that's from and a none, bio none of those, uh, no antibiotic can make it through an advanced purification treatment plant. So that's, they're yeah. talking about uh, wastewater. According water. to this study. They're, they're talking they're about talking wastewater about waste treatment. They're talking about what's down in Santa Cruz right they're now. They're talking about normal wastewater treatment. They are not designed to remove those. And in yeah, fact. That paper, in fact, underscores what our concern is with secondary treated sewage going out into the ocean. That is where the concern is with that kind of right. paper. It is not a purified water project that they're talking about. They're talking about what happens at Santa, Santa Cruz Treatment Center right now and gets pumped out into the ocean. These yeah. guys are talking about something that happens yeah, in Los okay. like Angeles. We're trying, to, we're trying to clarify your misinformation and sorry, Colonel, we're done well, with this item. No, sorry, done? we're done. You had your time. Well, you had your time, you need to sit down. You need water. to sit down. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. This God. graphic was made um, by Mr. Russell Boucher, who worked a lot on the, um, the desal alternative campaign. And I urge you to really think back to what happened at that campaign. There are many similarities to what's happening now with the Pure Water SoCal. Many of your customers are not even aware of this project. 
Do you have a comment on the on the report, which yes, is I what? Do. So I see your sign, okay. but this is an item where we are discussing the community water plan. And if you have a comment about that plan, that's I fine. Do. But not come up here and wave I a sign do. and get My attention. My time is clicking. May I speak? Thank yes, you. Yes, but about Thank the you. topic. Otherwise, no. Thank you. I, I like your report that you encourage public participation we in your do, decision. We do, but you know what? You guys. I would like to point me, out that the, the alternative. For, excuse me. Stop, stop the timer for a second. I did stop. Stop. Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. To come up here and rant over and over again and waste the public's time, and not stay on topic is not helping anything. So please stay on topic. Thank Go you. Ahead, start the timer. I'm going to stay on topic and address your community water plan and um, point out that it does not involve the Live Oak residents that have three pieces of communication in your packet today. And um, your water rate increase material did not address or even name Pure Water SoCal in its uh, the mailing. So your customers are not uh, aware of the Pure Water SoCal, and this relates to the community water plan what you're talking about. Yes. So being accurate with your information is important. And I feel that I there have been some things that have not been accurate, namely that the rate increases did not name Pure Water SoCal in the information. I also feel that it is uh, I in talking about water quality and the Pure Water SoCal issue that you do need to address NDMA you do need to address ibuprofen and DEET and things that Carollo did say that they can't get out. And you do need to address the, uh, the National Water Research Institute's warning in September of 2017 that this project relies upon it working perfectly 100% of the time. That's what they said. And we all know that human error is always there. Um, I think it would behoove you to look at what happened with the uh, desal alternatives. There is a move afoot. This has to do with the community water plans again? It's I'm sorry, and but I we're talking about a report. I also want to point out to you that uh, Pure Water Monterey, the in the Monterey Herald, was, was uh, in the news regarding um, that they have pulled back on their Pure Water Monterey project in favor of desal. So take a look at the Monterey Herald. Okay, well, you know. And I also um, want to just point out that you need to address more publicly what the Twin Lakes Church. Okay, time's church up. You need to stay on topic more. Yeah, and you need to stop but interrupting the public, Sorry. you know? It is so disruptive. And you know what? All you have to do is, you is let the people speak. staying on topic and just not coming up here and ranting, you'll have all the time you want. I am not ranting. I am publicly participating. As okay. you say, you, you encourage. Thank you very much. And Mr. So Duncan, Dr. happy Lee, birthday. May, Thank I you. may I add to something? You know, uh, it's understandable that um, until you become knowledgeable about w water reuse and purification, just as the board said two or three years ago that you guys wanted to fully understand it. And a good example, uh, until you understand it and, and become knowledgeable and can make an informed decision, um, a sense of uh, apprehension is, is fully uh, anticipated, uh, not uncommon. As with anything, you fear what you don't understand. And I think it's demonstrated, demonstrated in, uh, with San Diego, where probably about 15 years ago, about 25% of the people were in favor of, of purification, 75% against. And over the last many years, San Diego has un undertaken an effort to educate, truly educate, get out there and inform the people day after day. And now those numbers are in the, about the 80% support it. So through education, proper education and understanding and learning, you can see how the public um, embraces it. Okay. So. Including environmental organizations. Yes, and, and many right. environmental In fact, if we want to really fully educate people, we need to tell them how foul the water is in the river and how little it is treated. And these people who scream about water quality just assume it's high quality when it's not. And it's not treated. and you want to basically plaster it all over the district without even having looked at it. You go to the, you go to the city, look at the city's 
reports on this, and that's foul stuff compared to groundwater, and even w worse, uh, even better is, is pure water, because it indeed is pure. I would not call it foul stuff. I would say that it, it meets all the drinking water standards, it, but, but if you're talking about a certain things like ibuprofen or antibiotics, they're going to be more in surface water than they right. are. Right. If they're all CEC, they're going to be so in groundwater so or purified water. Right. All right, so we move on to item 6.6. .6. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Does that mean you don't want me to present my memo? <laughs> no, but I mean, I, it sounds before. like you're in a good situation. It's actually a, that you a very have somebody willing to help. It's a straightforward <laughs> memo, so you don't need to present. Okay, much. I'm happy to answer any questions. It, it does have, have a uh, roll call on it, though. Is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. but yes, but it seems. I mean, it, it, I'm really thankful that John's willing to step back in. Yep. We are too, and we were really thankful for uh, for Troy's assistance over the last three months. He was a great addition, and we yeah. you know we applaud mm -hmm. him and honor him. So. Yeah. So we will. Um, I'll make the motion. Motion. I'll, I'll second. Second. It's a, yeah. Okay. Public comment. And. I, um, do you want to take call. any public comment on that? Item? Yeah. Oh, sure. sure. Anybody? I, well, I didn't imagine there would be okay. much public I just comment. <laughs> but just want to make sure we're good. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing none. Um, roll call, please. Director Laser. Yes. Vice President Dan Ye Daniel. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Lazier. Yes, and please thank him. Thank for you. Us. Mm -hmm. thank, well, well, we have to wait for Calper's approval. Right. Um, so thank you. But for being his willingness. All right. Next is item six point seven, uh, changes to meter drop-in fees. So this is a follow-up memo to the variance that the board granted in January, um, as we were going through the process of evaluating the applications and requests that we received for customers that had a one-inch meter and wanted to downsize. We ran across the question of water capacity fees. Typically, when a customer downsizes their meter, they um, forfeit their water capacity uh, for the larger meter. And so, in this instance, we have run across some customers who may, uh, exp they could technically quali uh, qualify for using a 5 8 inch meter, but they may experience some loss in pressure, especially if they're at elevation. So we're um, asking the board to consider giving us a little bit of a grace period to correspond with the variance grace period for customers who do downsize to a 5 8 inch, discover that they do have some pressure issues and would like to move back to a one, one inch. They don't have to pay the one inch water capacity fees again. Um, the other thing that we um, discovered is that um, with the new meters that we're putting in the ground, we haven't looked at our meter drop in fees since uh, March of 2013. So we reevaluated those. Um, those meter drop-in fees have increased uh, because of increases in labor costs and increases in, in the cost of the meters. So we're suggesting uh, new fees for meter drop-in fees. We're also suggesting a labor-only fee so that we, if we do have a customer who downsizes to a 5 8 inch, decides that um, that's not going to be sufficient to meet their needs and wants to move back to a 1 inch meter, we can charge them just the labor to install the one inch meter that they previously had. So those are the those are the motions that we're asking you to consider this evening, um, granting the grace period for water capacity fees and approving the new meter drop in fee schedule. Okay, questions? Yeah, just, I thought it was odd that uh, the 5 8 inch restricted was a hi slightly higher than a 5 8 inch the reason for that is the equipment um, cost for the flow restrictor. Okay. A 5 8 inch meter doesn't have that. Okay. The restrictor does have the flow restrictor. Other questions? Public comment? Hello, Jack Zahorski. Been a so called Water Creek District customer for over four decades, over three decades where I am right now. <coughs> I'm one of the people that fall into this particular area. Um, I know that when, and first of all, let me say I've talked to Leslie, I've talked to Taj, I can't go into it myself. I'd like to thank him, by the way, for his time. He's put a lot of time, patience, and he's been great on all this. And we got into a lot of discussions. I'm one of those that's right on the border. Um, when the lot was originally developed where I built a home on it, uh, Soquel Creek came in and they determined that eh, this is borderline, we better put a one inch in. And it's been there for over three decades, you know, and it hasn't been an issue, it hasn't been a problem. Um, when we ran the calculations, I am one of those on the borderline, as is my neighbor and, and a few others. Uh, the number of people that are under this is very small. I mean, considering you handle what, like 17,000 people, it's well under 100. A lot of those probably doesn't really matter. They can go to a 5 8. 
but there are a few of us that are on that border. And what you guys did when you originally came up with this is you came up with particular people such as those with you know fire suppression equipment other things and you said you know we have to allow for this because you know we don't want to mess them over and you took care of probably 99 percent of the people but there's like a dozen or two of us <laughs> that kind of got shoved to the side and as a result of this what's going to happen is my rates are going to more than double um 90 percent of my bill is going to go towards the meter cost um, and for someone that conserves and all, it's, it's kind of a concerning for me. And what I'm hoping that, y and, and I think what, tr what Leslie's trying to do and what uh, Josh you know, came up with is they're doing the best with the limitations that you've set to them as to how to be as fair as possible because they realize there's an issue here. And so I really need to talk to you guys, the next level up, as they said, you know, um, to see if there's a way maybe you can add another variance in there, grandfather in a few of us that have had these meters forever in this place that has always been at this one inch and just grandfather us in and say going forward we're doing five eighths. But for these people, you know, that have been here for, you know, a long time that have always had this meter and has always been put in there, instead of spending the money to put in a smaller meter <laughs> and have it costing the Water Creek District money, why not just leave it the way it is, grandfather that in and you know, and, and, it, and again, if there needs to be like, I think you're charging an extra dollar fifty because of the fire suppression. I'm sure that's probably like a, it's a unique thing, so you got an administrative fee or something like that. You know, go ahead and charge the extra dollar fifty for it, but put us in with those other ones that you've already, and that's what we're requesting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Becky Steinbrenner, I just want to point out to you that. This anomaly was discovered by your rate payer, Mr. John Cole, who took you to court and won for illegal rate structuring. So that was John Cole's work that determined this, this, this anomaly. And I want to give him credit. Thank you. Thoughts? Nothing to do with John. Questions? Cole. I mean, it sounds like to me that would be a different issue to come back with some kind of other variants. I mean, I think this is the best solution we have for right now. Yeah. Sounds like. And um, you could make, take advantage of it, I think, couldn't it? Yeah, you could take advantage of it and try it. Well, except the 5 eighths might not work. But if it doesn't work, that's the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, understood. We don't know whether it will work or not. Uh, um. Correct. I, I think Mr. Zahorky is fairly certain that it's not going to work, the smaller meter. So that seems to lend itself to the fact that he does require a one-inch meter in the capacity. And you should pay for it. So yeah. Well, I mean, we can. I don't know if some some if staff has some idea to somehow have it be fair to all customers evenly. I I, I don't know, but I think for now, I mean, for the people involved, this seems like the best solution we can come up with. Mm -hmm. We we don't, but let us. You know, I mean, I think. I mean, we're motions are, are prudent now, but we yeah. will give it some thought. Let us go back. We do take that. I mean, we just have to, we yeah, just have to be we fair. We're willing to look. We just have There's to be a sure couple we're ideas we're not even ready to, to discuss, but we'll just float by engineering, see if they have any okay. merit. Okay. Well, to me, it's um, it the meter size is a proxy for how much water you right. can use, but it's not what you do use. So that's there's a disconnect there. And I know that's what the whole basis of the, the rate structure is on. But I, I think it's, there, there's, um, it's not perfect. Yeah. That's the, the bottom line. Yeah, right. You yeah. Go. You go. Okay. Well, I think this still makes sense. So I'll, I'll make both motions. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, so and and so staff keep yeah, you know we'll see we'll see what we can come up with creatively to still be fair to everyone and see if we can solve the problem. Yeah, and thank you both to um, Leslie and Taj for working on that. All right, um, last item of the night, rebid. Yeah, yeah, we're excited to get this going. Um, as you recall, we only received one bid last time we. We put the Granite Way well site improvements out. Uh, since that time, we did reject that bid and procured the electrical cabinet as well as the pumping equipment. 
uh, you know, pumping equipment has been delayed based on their need for good weather. Um, hopefully, if next week is clear, they'll be here to set the pump and, and pedestal. Um, so this this now rebid does not include those two items. It's just the remainder of the improvements, the site minor grading, um, some uh, electrical transformer, storm drain, um, some above ground piping, and, and some fencing. So that we hope to uh, receive more than one bid, and I think we will get more than one bid um, in May, and then hopefully we can proceed this summer and finish in the fall, and then get that back online, get it online okay. for Good. for the first time. Good. Yeah. Questions? Members of the public? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I go by this site every day and have wondered what was going on. I do, and I do want to bring to your board again the the critical concern of a possible contamination flume, plume in this area. And um, I have been talking with um, people associated with the project and there is concern there as well. So it is um, important that this well be sealed uh, very far down. I think that Mr. Dufour has told me it would be sealed 50 feet it may need to be sealed deeper because of this possible contamination plume. I'm aware that your district did uh, contamination studies of volatile things that would be associated with a dry cleaner, and that would make sense with the former dry cleaner there. What was not known at the time those studies were done was that there was a leaking fuel tank, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 gallon fuel tank, and it's still unknown what was in that tank because of the improper way it was handled. The district attorney dealt with that, and you can go um, look at that case and get the full report of contaminants that were found at the site. They do not match um, diesel. What they do comport with more is something like a bunker C oil, which would make sense if you look at the historic use of that land the low threat case closure was improperly and prematurely closed, and that has also been verified by area experts. So it is very possible and very likely that there is a contamination plume that is following the groundwater flow that is going directly to that well. So I urge you to possibly work with the developers and put in some monitoring wells uh, to catch uh, any um, tip of a plume that could be headed your way and to uh, seal this well at a very uh, maybe abnormally deeper depth than you might because of this possible and very real threat to the safety of this water. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Um. subject you should listen to Ms. Steinbrenner and you should have the notes reported and you should promptly have a resolution proposed that you implement Ms. Steinbrenner's concerns and her criteria and direct your staff to do that. I'm s really, that's an environmental obligation you have. She brings up enough secret concerns in her statement to make that clear, but you have a fiduciary obligation as well to your customers and also to that well area. So please put a paragraph together that implements her concerns and that your staff is to make corrective action, Mr. Duncan, uh, assuredly of those. Of compliment, as I understand the report here, your staff rejected an overpriced bid that was clearly a ripoff of your rate payers and your finances uh, and did it in its own procurement. Um, if that's the case, I compliment Mr. Dufour or whoever did that for saving apparently $300,000 or more of your ratepayers' money from being wasted with a bad buy, an overpriced, uh, overpriced sale, solicitation for equipment. Uh, again, please implement Ms. Steinbrenner's concerns, have your recorder type them out, and be responsible and do the, the clear 
prudent thing you should do for your ratepayers and customers. Have that well monitored or shut it off. Okay. Any motions? I'll move to proceed with the bidding. So are there two motions? There are two motions. I'll, I'll, I'll take them both. I'll second <laughs> those. Seconded. <laughs> Roll call, please. Director Lather. Yes. Vice President Daniels. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Lazier. Yes. Um, there is only um, written communications now and then um, closed session. So anything about written communications? They all have been responded to. I think that's oh. fine. All right. Anyone in the public on written communications? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I just um, would like to reiterate that this um, Chanticleer advanced water treatment facility was not properly vetted to the residents in the Live Oak area once the scope of the project was changed. That's one of the tenets of the lawsuit that I'm bringing against the district for sequel violation. And I am aware Mr. Duncan has made claims that there have been public meetings and I think his responses are interesting, but um, I really think that you need to go back and uh, do this properly and um, address these people's concerns. Um, hold more and frequent, more and uh, well-noticed public meetings in the Live Oak area because these people were essentially left out of the process being customers of Santa Cruz City Water District and this facility is not even within the district's boundary. Thank you. Okay. C can I make a comment or two yes. about that? I think it's in, um, informative to the board and also um, the right thing to do by the people who wrote the letters. Um, but can you get us down there? Yeah. So I think the first letter uh, is by Mr. Oh gosh, I gotta pull this Bulger. up. B Bulger. And I forgot the Mr. in there in haste on a Friday afternoon to get a letter out, so I want to apologize. But what he did do was very appreciative. If you go down a little bit, Shelley, he took the main points out of here. Why? Uh, few points that we think uh, why it's important to Live Oak residences and he put that into Live Oak next door which I'm a member of because I'm I live in Live Oak and um, from that it generated uh, a response from the person who wrote the next letter Miss uh, Jackson uh, wrote this letter and uh, yeah the next letter the third one yeah, she w she wrote this letter before she saw um, Mr. Bulger's four comments and that uh, taken from ours. And then after she saw Mr. Bulger Bulger's comments, she uh, refrained and said, "You know, this is this makes much better sense to me now that I uh, see see what uh, Sokel's doing." And subsequent to that, uh, I met with Miss Jackson. I said. Um, you know, it's really refreshing, so refreshing in today's society to see somebody take information, have an opinion, but then take factual information and reform their opinion, not to support it, but to, to make an informed decision. And that's what she did uh, in the subsequent post in Live Oak. And then I met with her and we went through the, uh, the project details and the Chanticleer site and the why. And she actually said, Oh, I understand why you know it's not why it's appropriate to locate a facility there because Live Oak uh, withdraws you know hundreds of acre feet of groundwater, so they're part of, they have some skin in the game, so to speak, and that um, she actually said this is th I think this was her exact terms. This is a high tech environmental project, and it should be explained that way. So. I just want to give a shout out to her. We're continuing dialogue, but it's just a great example when you are able to disseminate factual information. Um, some people do change their minds, and, and you know, I, it's so refreshing to see that. And, and we do have some meetings, more general Developing meetings, some of that, yeah. coming up. Yep. Okay. So um, we now will adjourn to a closed session. Um, is there anyone who wishes to make a comment prior to the closed session?
seeing none, we will adjourn and go into closed session.